Hello and welcome to Simply Intoxicating. Failure of business is a part of capitalism. With the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code of 2016 becoming the law of the land, India joins the club. Government has termed it as a historic legislation. The court consolidates the scattered insolvency laws of India into a single piece of legislation. The basic objective of the code is to help a distressed entity to go through a strict, time-bound insolvency resolution process which will be handled by solvency professionals so that it can come out healthier. But if the process fails, then the entity goes for liquidation. The message is loud and clear, survival of the fittest and protection of the economic value of the assets. The Indian banking sector, whose NPAs is almost about to touch the moon, has obviously welcomed the bank bankruptcy code. Experience from developed jurisdiction has shown that strong insolvency laws has not only promoted entrepreneurial risks, but it has also reduced the cost of borrowings and better behavior by the debtors in terms of fiscal discipline. Now the issue is how the Indian Inc. responds to the bankruptcy code, whether it can bring a turnaround in the overall lending business in India. Now before we discuss these issues with our panelists, let's quickly have a look at the overall scheme of the code. Now, insolvency is a situation where an individual or corporation is unable to meet their financial obligation. Why a bankruptcy code? As per the World's Bank report, in India, 25 cents in a dollar is recovered in 4.5 years compared to 80 cents of dollar in 1.5 years in US. The code is applicable to all entities covered under Companies Act, individuals and partnership firms. Under SICA, 100% net worth erosion was required, whereas under bankruptcy code, any financial default of rupees 1 lakh or above can trigger the insolvency process. In matters of corporate insolvency, application can be filed before the National Company Law Tribunal, which has been recently constituted, and the application can be filed by financial creditor, operational creditor, or the debtor company itself. Once the application is filed before the NCLT, it has to be accepted or rejected within a timeline of 14 days. Let's say if it is accepted, then the insolvency resolution professional is appointed who takes over the management of the company. So no asset stripping happens. Insolvency resolution process will go on for 180 days with a one-time extension of 90 days and simultaneously runs a moratorium period. All decisions have to be approved by at least 75% of voting share of financial creditors. Now, if this insolvency still fails, the company goes for liquidation. Now, straight away going to our panelists to discuss all the issues and to decode this bankruptcy code, we have Mr. Anil Bharadwaj. He is the Secretary General, Federation of Indian Micro and Small and Medium Enterprises. We have Ms. Manisha Dheer. She is the founding and managing partner Dheer and Dheer Associates. And finally, we have Mr. Dr. Risham Garg, Professor at National Law University, Delhi. Welcome all of you. Uh, let me begin the discussion by asking you, ma'am, uh, we have had DRTs and we were really, really excited when DRTs came. Then came the SAFESI and now finally the bankruptcy code. You have seen the evolution of the entire insolvency laws, laws in India. Do you really believe this is going to make a fundamental change or is it, I mean, it's too premature to, dis I mean, to say anything? Thank you, Sudipto. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say that uh, the bankruptcy court is a systemic change. Uh, creation of a single law in favor of multi multiplicity of loans. DRT was actually created for the purpose of recovery of loans and surface was enacted for enforcement of securities. The new code is a comprehensive legislation where a single default will enable an insolvency professional to take over the businesses of the company which was not there in the Sarifasi Act, nor in the, the DRT, DRT Act. Also, the a major shift is from uh, debtors in possession to creditors in possession. So there is a substantial change with respect to what the DRT and Sarifasi was doing uh, and as compared to what the current code is doing. So I think that would answer the question that what is the change, whether it is a substantial change. According to me, it is a very substantial change, a single code taking over the entire laws of the DRTs and the SARFSA, which will help in faster resolution. See, first of all, let's see at the conceptual level itself. I think uh, it's a definitely a change in paradigm in so many ways. Uh, if you look at it, I mean, it's very, very comprehensive in the sense that, you know, 
as ma'am has also mentioned that in favor of several disjointed laws that were there to recover the debts, uh, it puts them under just one umbrella. So it's a very comprehensive law. Second part of its comprehensivity is with regards to that it applies not only to companies, but also to individuals as well as partnership and firms. So under one roof, we are trying to resolve all the problems that are related to recovery of debt and also resolution of insolvency. And uh, apart from that, you know, one another factor, I mean, based on the experience that we had of the DRTs and the CICA and related BIFR mechanisms, that it took decades, you know, to resolve a particular issue of insolvency, particularly of uh, uh, reviving a company. So here comes uh, the most important provisions in this new code and that are time bound. So 180 days plus 90 and the matter is over. Either you resolve the insolvency, put the company on the revival or path or, or wiped out. So there is no midway. And uh, currently the scope lies, uh, I mean, our hope lies that, you know, there would not be uh, litigations to derail this process and we would rather believe that, you know, ultimately uh, the, the spirit of this law will prevail and 180 days plus 90 days within that people would be aware or people would know whether the, there is going to be the resolution or there is going to be the liquidation. Yes, I mean, we have always been hopeful but most of the cases we, in some or other way we end up in the litigation. I am coming to Dr. Risham Gar. So what's your take on this? Do you think this will uh, bring a better behavior in the debtors in terms of fiscal discipline? Now, do they, do they have a stake involved so that we can expect, I mean, less of, of uh, defaults, frauds, and I mean, in other sense, I would say, can we say that episodes like Kingfisher Airlines, they won't be possible under the bankruptcy code? As a part of the response, I would like to start by saying that my approach will be analytical. And in the analytical approach, I would reframe from being judgmental whether it would be successful or not. But certainly I would prefer to highlight a few issues. Uh, why, why first uh, we require DRT? Why in the first stage we required the DRT? And then we took lessons from that DRT, RDB5 Act and enacted the surface And then ultimately uh, we were able to identify that we have to take the jurisdiction out of the civil courts and the civil procedure. Then, whilst this, uh, this code was being drafted by the IBC drafting team, uh, if we read the BLRC report number one, they have considered the uh, analytical study, what were the reasons? Uh, one major reason was the individuals which were involved, for example, the court officials, the, the uh, liquidators, official liquidators. So we wanted to remove that element as well. Today we have identified that yes, we require the reorganization and we have refrained from using the word restructuring. Instead we use the term insolvency resolution process. So this is a resolution process which inculcates the reorganization and the restructuring as well. So ma'am, uh, my second question, I mean, you have been in the insolvency practice since years. We have had this timeline under every law, I mean before the DRT or even under the surface. Now we have a very strict timeline and this is one of the highlights that the need for speed which is being delivered by the bankruptcy code. But do you think we would be able to adhere to the timelines or what could be the practical challenges in adhering to the timelines considering the intervention of the courts? I, was, I would say the basic difference between surface and other acts with respect to timelines are concerned is that as far as this act is concerned, if the timelines are not adhered to, you face winding up, liquidation, period. Even the adjudicator does not have any role to extend the period beyond the 90 days which is permitted and that also with the consent of 75% of the security creditors. So that, that is a very, very major change in terms of timelines because timelines, right, right, rightly pointed out, have been specified. And so if the resolution process fails, liquidation is the only Automatic. Way. So, okay. so the, there are only two options. Either there is a resolution plan in place or the resolution plan gets rejected. And 
liquidation is automatic after that. So this is a vast difference from the other acts. And I think this will go a major way in, in adhering to the timeline, so to speak, as far as uh, so the does process the is concerned. law provide a right of appeal before a resolution, if a resolution plan has been approved by the creditors committee? Can it be challenged? In the it, it, it can be challenged, uh, but the, they have restricted the challenge only to malpractice or a fraud. As far as the resolution is con plan is concerned, they have restricted the challenge only to malpractice or fraud. Do you think, I mean, the code has reduced the scope of judicial intervention? I mean, where the commercial wisdom is now weighing over the judicial wisdom? So, uh, I will I will say that it's it's a bankruptcy is for a business it, considering it's corporate or even in case of individuals or uh, what are our target area target area is the business whether it is be the corporate or the partnership or the MSME sector so think like a businessman and what are the other stakeholders another stakeholder is the bank and the third stakeholder is the labor so there has to be a time frame in the previous uh, frame when the debtor was uh, allowed to keep in possession of the assets and manage the business but they were able to manipulate the system so and there were lots of uh, instances and we have a lot of decided cases as well where the promoters and the directors and the management were found to have confiscated and misappropriated the assets of the company to themselves we have decided cases to that so certainly the timeline will be instrumental and when the timeline is there uh, the uh, adjudicating authority is bound to comply with that timeline and apart from that uh, the most important aspect is we are reducing any interference by any other adjudicatory authority there is only one adjudicatory authority for the corporates which is the NCLT and there is only one adjudicatory authority for the others that is the individuals and partnership which is the DRT uh, what I feel is you know uh, different provisions would provide particularly the one you know uh, first of all that it equalizes different uh, uh, creditors for example whether it's a secured creditor unsecured creditor operational creditor and uh, anybody can trigger uh, an insolvency mechanism and that is very very important that's a powerful tool that's a powerful that's tool and and i feel you know that is going to induce a kind of a fiscal discipline or financial discipline in our in markets which was completely unheard of for example i come from the msme uh, sector and most of our uh, problems are related to unpaid dues like you know, i mean uh, msme supply to large companies large companies won't pay so any small company tomorrow can take this large company through this route so this and, and can trigger, can force a trigger for insolvency and that's going to have a, a very different impact. kind of a discipline. So we can say the now they have a stake involved, I mean to Absolutely. exercise fiscal so discipline. Even a smallest of company can take on the largest of companies and that can have a very, uh, you can say benign impact on the discipline part. Secondly, uh, putting the professionals again uh, in, in, in comparison to say for example judges, uh, that also makes a difference because ultimately whether a company is revival or not, it's a commercial decision and has to come from professionals who, own, who know that how a particular business is run rather than, for example, because there is no legal point. It's a value judgment. Now, let's come into a very serious issue that this entire bankruptcy code is a creditor-centric legislation, whereas in the US it's a debtor-centric legislation. So in other words, what we are saying is, if the company is going through a resolution process, an insolvency professional comes in and he takes over the management of the company. So do you think this is a huge cultural change in our country? How are we going to cope up with this and whether this change will be successful? So let me answer by saying that countries which are credit centric have already rethinking. They are finding that the creditors being involved in the resolution plan alone does not work. So it's my, it's my opinion that the, the promoters or the ex-management should always be involved in the resolution plan. Maybe they shouldn't have any voting rights in terms of accepting or non-accepting. But they should always be closely associated because after all, these are the businesses they have run. They know the ins and outs of, the, of the business. And my personal take on this is that they should be associated. Maybe not in the terms of, like I said, voting rights in terms of approving the plan, but definitely. Uh, so, and in fact, in fact, the, the creditor-centric countries 
our rethinking and come back, uh, to, come back to not data centric maybe but, but maybe a middle maybe, path, maybe a middle path. path right. i would say that in uh, i mean coming from the industry perspective the the us uh, system is shade better than than the, the system that we is proposed here but whatever is there i mean there there are two different issues if you look at the large companies the the powers of the board is suspended and uh, the insolvency professional is in charge but of the rest of the operational people, managers, they remain as it, as, is. as it is. So they are running the company, like you know, vice president marketing, vice president production, this and that. So, so only the board is suspended. So the board is suspended. Right. So there is not much of a problem. But now when the problem comes is that when you have an SME. Now MSME is a management as well as the chief operating officer and the CEO. So he is the hands-on person. If you remove him. There is nothing, nothing because left. everything knowledge is tested in the brain of this man. If you take him out, everything collapses. So there lies our worries. I, I mean, how we are going to uh, solve this? Maybe informally they continue to work closely and cooperate with each other because ultimately it is in the interest of uh, uh, the person who has uh, requested for liquidation that uh, company ultimately survives and restructured or whatever the goal was is achieved. But there, I think, uh, I mean, uh, painting both the MSMEs and the co large corporates with the same brush, I think, is going to be having difficulties. So, because you have all now in, uh, raised the issue of MSME, do you, you are happy with the final shape of the code from the perspective of the MSME sector? Do you think, as it's I said, going I mean, it's a huge, de huge development because 97 percent of MSMEs have been or are uh, pro proprietorship partnership firms. And there were no mechanisms whatsoever available for them because BFR was for the large companies. And there was nothing for MSMEs in terms of seeking protection during the period when the restructuring is taking place. So even if I am requesting my bank and the bank is restructuring my loan, any debtor, especially the crown debts that can take me to the court, can take possession of my properties and sell them off. And it has happened often. So there was no calm period, there was no hold on period till this restructuring was taking place. So for us also, I think a very There's large a number of is a huge, huge relief that, you know, till the restructuring is taking place, there is nothing that is coming in between and, and disrupting the process. So the, in this insolvency process, uh, about the individuals and the partnership firms, so there is a concept of fresh start. So, uh, but the threshold limit is too low. So do you think uh, actually anyone would be able I, I, to I fully agree, agree with you and 35,000 rupees is too small. It's, it's, uh, it's, it says gross annual income of data does not, should not exceed 60,000. Uh, I think uh, I agree with you. I mean it could have been increased but there lies, uh, I mean the act provides that this they could be increased. Be it can be increased. Hopefully it would be increased. But the point is you know uh, a very large number of people in India are committing suicide even for these smaller uh, size loans. Farmers committing suicide for a buffalo loan or for some cow loan, goat loan. So, I mean, if you look at this particular uh, provision provides for relief for people, for example, who are under microfinancing and we have a huge microfinancing uh, sector, sector thriving in the country. For them, in the case of default, there was nothing. So, I mean, those were uh, routinely imprisoned. If you look at the district magistrates, uh, big files are there when, when defaults for 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 people are routinely being sent to jail. And 13 day jail or 14 day jail and it is recurring. So I think uh, although, uh, I mean, uh, we would have welcomed it had it been four, five, six times more than what it, it is in currently in shape. So maybe I'd like to interject one thing. Uh, so the, 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 the drafters of the code have uh, have given noble suggestions uh, and I believe the, there is a big responsibility upon the government to ensure uh, who are the uh, most needed recipients of the scheme. So certainly uh, there is a, a considerable lack of uh, approach in the IBC to focus upon the, uh, the uh, masses of the, the country and if the dispute resolution is only in the DRTs that is in the district and that also might not be possible in all the districts of the country. How will a poor farmer or an individual of a village uh, consider even going to the district to file his claim? So for those people there must be some resolution in the village or even in some sort of a circuit court or a uh, mobile court something like that which can uh, be a, a hybrid of the DRT if 
if this drt uh, concept is continued and there is no special arrangement made for the farmers or the people from the villages or small towns then this will be a no, you have raised a very important Excess point because drts i was just going through the statistics there are already 60000 cases pending before drts now with the individuals now the adjudicating body for the individuals and partnership forms would be the drt so it requires for a huge i mean upscaling yeah the so maybe the pending cases of drts will gradually be put on before the nclt but the question is another very important aspect is the drt itself is a is a non structured entity it's not a permanent establishment so you need to make so whatever establishment adjudicatory mechanisms we have in the country they are permanent establishment which are the supreme court the high court and the the civil courts the drts are not successful and a major reason is that they are not permanent they are renewed from time to time uh we have some experiments with the and special so courts and so on and so many seats are lying vacant in drat exactly. so I many seats to interject are because the, the basic cause is also that, that most of the seats are lying vacant the drts are not functioning fully because it's not manned that is a problem Absolutely. i won't blame the institution it's not manned currently the requirement is much higher than the number of people there so one very important issue uh, which is creating a lot of confusion is the voluntary winding up proceedings in the companies act where the high court is the adjudicatory body Please let me explain to you because voluntary winding up is completely different from winding up so under the code what has been envisaged is that only those companies uh, where the insolvency pr uh, process has not been completed within the specified time or with the the process plan the plan has been specifically rejected by the by the nclt NCLT. will be sent for winding up under the particular act the rest of the winding up will be carried on under the companies act whether it is voluntary or otherwise uh, the provision with respect to voluntary winding up uh, under the act is that where there is a default then there is no winding the code will be triggered uh, triggered off so there is no question of voluntary winding up for the rest with respect to whether the company has passed a special resolution for winding up or whether there is a, uh, whether the company has acted against the interests of the state all will be governed under the company Come court dr gurg i would like to raise this issue of the uh, the cross border insolvency now if you one one goes to the court the impression is that it has only postponed it for bilateral negotiation and agreements between the countries now we have live examples like kingfisher airlines where the assets are located abroad so how are we going to tackle on whether the court has not sufficiently dealt with this issue what's your take on this yeah they have uh, hurriedly uh, as uh, mr bhardwaj had mentioned that uh, the court was referred to the jpc and the jpc felt that we cannot approve the court in such a manner so we have to have some provision with respect to the cross border insolvency and consequently we inserted two provisions which reflect the uh, cross country cooperation so only if there is a creditor and there is some sorry if there is a debtor in my country and he has assets outside then we have to presume a sort of a cross country cooperation and there has to be in place some protocols and then only we can proceed against them so that's an individual basis and it's time consuming and again that will be of a great uh, there will be great practical difficulty so better better and the the only permanent solution is to uh, adopt the ancestral model law if we adopt the ancestral model law there are certain concepts for example recognizing a foreign main proceeding or a foreign main non main proceeding or a subsidiary proceeding and which recognizes the uh, the uh, that is the action or the relief by the foreign creditor itself so in case of vijay malya what we are doing now is red corner notice or trying extradition or all sort of things all sort of things absolutely had we and postman directorate so exactly, had we had, had everything we, we yes. have we have applied it if we have already the law in place so the uh, bangalore uh, drt passes an order the creditor the professional can take that order to the uk court and say see we have a asset seizure and kindly allow us to realize those assets or seize those assets and that will be granted that is the same thing that is the benefit of the ancestral model law you don't need anything else so since we are running out of time so i mean i'll start with you your closing remarks i mean should we take the bankruptcy code with a pinch of salt i mean how how do you take it? i look at it uh, i mean uh, in terms of a lot of hope i would say uh, i remember uh, let me share with you a small incident i mean 2 years ago there was world bank organized a asia insolvency forum in philippines and i represented uh, india and this and 
I had a fantastic experience that, you know, uh, the country in Asia that uh, had sort of a leap in many commercial laws is South Korea. South Korea is considered one of the good examples. And the South Korean uh, judge there uh, explained through an analogy, he said, you know, when an asset is stressed, it's like an ice of cube on your palm. So you have to act very, very fast. Do whatever is required. Provide man, provide consultancy, provide this, provide that, whatever. But it's melting. So exactly. fast, 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 fast. So speed is the most important thing. That and is the successful if, mantra of the course. Yeah, so if we can adhere to that and if we can achieve that, I think we would have achieved 99% of it. Well, I would say that it's, it's going to be highly litigated because constitutional rights are being affected. I, we should brace ourselves for a long litigation and see how we can strengthen our court. Uh, one more suggestion is that many of the, the court relies upon subordinate legislation. So there is a need for good quality rules and regulations yeah, because yeah. many of the uh, sections rely upon rules and regulations Absolutely. to be framed by central government. In fact, government. the entire yeah. the implementation yeah. is dependent so, on so the rules So a lot of it, so we need very good quality subordinate, subordinated legislation. And of course, the infrastructure, the four pillars, as they say, as the regulator, the the DRTs and the NCLT have to be uh, have to be duly manned, and then and the IP professionals and the information utility. So these four pillars have to be very very much in place and robust pillars and, and robust. Before we wrap up, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister Modi has promised that within the coming three years, India would break into the top fifty countries on the parameters of ease of doing business. Well, we all would like to believe that really happens. Looking at the way our parliament functions, it's really commendable that the speed at which the bankruptcy code has been enacted. But there is greater need for speed for the infrastructure facilities to come into place. Thanks to my panelists for joining in the discussion and goodbye.